Thank you for coming by to Sit American Project. Please be sure to like the video for me if you will, and share the video if you can. Be sure to subscribe if you like my videos. Check out my previous video. I did a lot of extra work on it to get some special effects on it. Okay, the judge issued a gag order ahead of the hush money trial. A day after New York Supreme Court Justice Juan Merkin held a hearing regarding former President Donald Trump's bid to delay or dismiss the hush money case against him, the judge issued a gag order on the candidate. We're going to take a look at the court documents as well. The uncontested record reflecting the defendant's prior extrajudicial statements establishes a sufficient risk to the administration of justice. The order reads, and there exists no less restrictive means to prevent such risk. Given that the eve of the trial is upon us, it is without question that the imminency of the risk of harm is now paramount. Judge Merkin had said in a hearing last year that he would not be entering a gag order at that time, but the order comes after two other courts have issued gag orders on President Trump, and they have been upheld by appeals panels. The order is modeled after another gag order on President Trump, though the prohibition on statements about prospective jurors appears to be broader than previous orders. Let's take a look at the documents. Okay, here we have the documents. Supreme Court of the State of New York County of New York, Part 59. Juan M. Merkin is the judge. Defendant is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree in violation of Penal Law 175.1. The charges arise from allegations that defendant attempted to conceal an illegal scheme to influence the 2016 presidential election. Specifically, the people claim that defendant directed an attorney who worked for his company to pay $130,000 to an adult film actress shortly before the election to prevent her from publicizing an alleged sexual encounter with defendant. It is further alleged that the defendant thereafter reimbursed the attorney for the payments through a series of checks and caused business records associated with the repayments to be falsified to conceal his criminal conduct. Trial on this matter is scheduled to commence on April 15, 2024. On February 22, 24, the people filed the instant motion for an order restricting extrajudicial statements by a defendant for the duration of the trial. The restrictions sought are consistent in part with those upheld in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in United States v. Trump. On March 4, 2024, the defendant filed a response in opposition arguing that his speech may only be restricted by the application of a more strenuous standard than applied by the D.C. Circuit and that the people have failed to meet that standard in this case. Discussion The freedom of speech guaranteed by the First Amendment and the state's interest in the fair administration of justice are implicated by the relief sought. The balancing of these interests must come with the highest scrutiny. Properly applied, the test requires a court to make its own inquiry into the imminence and magnitude of the danger said to flow from the particular utterance. And then, to balance the character of the evil, as well as the likelihood against the need for free and unfettered expression. Talk about evil. Boy, these people are mean. 34 counts for what? Give me a break. With the standard set forth, and this court has reviewed the record of prior extrajudicial statements attributed to defendant as documented in Exhibits 1-16 through 16 of the People's Motion for an order restricting extrajudicial statements. Notably, defendant does not deny the utterance of any of those extrajudicial statements or the reported effect those statements had on the targeted parties. Rather, defendant argues that as the presumptive Republican nominee and leading candidate in a 2024 election, he must have unfettered access to the voting public to respond to attacks from political opponents and to criticize these public figures. I agree. Defendant's opposition to motion at pages 8 and 9, yet these extrajudicial statements went far beyond defending himself against attacks by public figures. Indeed, his statements were threatening, inflammatory, denigrating, and the targets of his statements ranged from local and federal officials, court and court staff, 
prosecutors, and staff assigned to the cases and private individuals, including grand jurors, performing their civic duty. People's Exhibit 1-16, through 16, the consequences of those statements included not only fear on the part of the individual targeted, but also the assignment of increased security resources to investigate threats and protect the individuals and family members thereof. People's Exhibit 1-16, through 16, such inflammatory extrajudicial statements undoubtedly risk impeding the orderly administration of this court. Defendant contends that continued compliance with existing orders referencing both this court's admonition at the start of the proceedings and the recent protective order issued on the 7th of March 2024 with respect to juror anonymity is an effective, less restrictive alternative. He supports this position by noting that he has generally refrained from making extrajudicial statements about individuals associated with the instant case in marked contrast from the significant volume of social media posts and other statements targeting individuals involved in every other court proceeding reflected in the people's submission. This court is unpersuaded. Although this court did not issue an order restricting defendant's speech at the inception of this case, choosing instead to issue an admonition given the nature and impact of the statements made against this court and a family member thereof. The district attorney and an assistant district attorney, the witnesses in this case, as well as the nature and impact of extrajudicial statements made by a defendant in the D.C. Circuit case which resulted in a D.C. Circuit issuing an order restricting his speech. And given that the eve of the trial is upon us, it is without question that the imminency of the risk of harm is now paramount. The Supreme Court in both Nebraska Press 427 U.S. 539-1976 and Shepard v. Maxwell 384-1966 holds that the court has the obligation to prevent actual harm to the integrity of the proceedings. When the fairness of the trial is threatened, reversals are but palliatives. The cure lies in those remedial measures that will prevent the prejudice as its inception. On the record submitted, and in keeping with its mandate, this court need not wait for the realization of further proscribed speech targeted at the participants of this trial. The people propose an additional restriction on speech with respect to prospective and sworn jurors. The restrictions sought are an extension of the previously issued protective order regarding juror anonymity. While the D.C. Circuit decision addressed only the risk of influencing witnesses and intimidating or harassing other trial participants in accordance with the low, lower court's ruling, it nevertheless opined that, quote, one of the most powerful interests supporting broad prohibitions on trial participants' speech is to avoid contamination of the jury pool, to protect the impartiality of the jury once selected, to confine evidentiary record before the jury to the courtroom, and to prevent intrusion on the jury's deliberations. While the protective order related to juror anonymity prevents the dissemination of certain personal information, it is not sufficient to prevent extrajudicial speech targeting jurors and exposing them to an atmosphere of intimidation. The proposed restrictions relating to jurors are narrowly tailored to obtain a result. The uncontested record reflecting the defendant's prior extrajudicial statements establishes a sufficient risk to the administration of justice consistent with the standards set forth. In landmark, and there exists no less restrictive means to prevent such risk. Therefore, it is hereby ordered that the people's motion for restriction on extrajudicial statements by the defendant is granted to the extent that the defendant is directed to refrain from the following A. Making or directing others to make public statements about known or reasonably foreseeable witnesses concerning their potential participation in the investigation or in this criminal proceeding. B. Making or directing others to make public statements about 1. Counsel in the case other than a district attorney. 2. Members of the court staff and a district attorney staff. Or 3. The family members of any counsel or staff member. If those statements are made with the intent to materially interfere with or to cause others to materially interfere with counsel's or staff's work in this criminal case. Or with the knowledge that such interference is likely to result. And C. 
making or directing others to make public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. Okay, there's a court document that sounds really ridiculous and unnecessary. And I think it's unfair, too. They keep talking about him in the news, left and right, nonstop. You know, maybe that's why he's getting popular. I don't know, but it uh, just seems abnormal to me, all the stuff that they're doing and all these charges. Incredible amount of uh, counts, 34 counts. Unbelievable. And there you have it. Thanks for coming by. Please be sure to like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And leave a comment. Let's talk about it. Have a great day. God bless.